Johann Christoph Friedrich von Schiller German, Johann Christoph Phi DC FNL, 10 November 1759 to 9 May 1805 was a German poet, philosopher, physician, historian, and playwright. During the last 17 years of his life 1788 to 1805, Schiller struck up a productive, if complicated, friendship with the already famous and influential Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. They frequently discussed issues concerning aesthetics, and Schiller encouraged Goethe to finish works he left as sketches. This relationship and these discussions led to a period now referred to as Weimar Classicism. They also worked together on Xenian, a collection of short satirical poems in which both Schiller and Goethe challenge opponents of their philosophical vision. <laughs> Early life and career Friedrich Schiller was born on 10 November 1759, in Marbach, Württemberg, as the only son of military doctor Johann Kaspar Schiller and Elizabeth Dorothea Codeway They also had five daughters, including Christophine, the eldest. Schiller grew up in a very religious family and spent much of his youth studying the Bible, which would later influence his writing for the theatre. His father was away in the Seven Years' War when Friedrich was born. He was named after King Frederick the Great, but he was called Fritz by nearly everyone. Kaspar Schiller was rarely home during the war, but he did manage to visit the family once in a while. His wife and children also visited him occasionally wherever he happened to be stationed. When the war ended in 1763, Schiller's father became a recruiting officer and was stationed in Schwäbisch Gmünd. The family moved with him. Due to the high cost of living, especially the rent, the family moved to the nearby Lorch. Although the family was happy in Lorch, Schiller's father found his work unsatisfying. He sometimes took his son with him. In Lorch, Schiller received his primary education. The quality of the lessons was fairly bad, and Friedrich regularly cut class with his older sister. Because his parents wanted Schiller to become a pastor, they had the pastor of the village instruct the boy in Latin and Greek. Pastor Moser was a good teacher, and later Schiller named the cleric in his first play Die Rauber the Robbers after him. As a boy, Schiller was excited by the idea of becoming a cleric and often put on black robes and pretended to preach. In 1766, the family left Lorch for the Duke of Württemberg's principal residence, Ludwigsburg. Schiller's father had not been paid for three years, and the family had been living on their savings but could no longer afford to do so. So Kaspar Schiller took an assignment to the garrison in Ludwigsburg. There the boy Schiller came to the attention of Karl Eugen, Duke of Württemberg. He entered the Karlschule Stuttgart an elite military academy founded by the Duke, in 1773, where he eventually studied medicine. During most of his short life, he suffered from illnesses that he tried to cure himself. While at the Karlschule, Schiller read Rousseau and Goethe and discussed classical ideals with his classmates. At school, he wrote his first play, The Robbers, which dramatizes the conflict between two aristocratic brothers. The elder, Karl Moore, leads a group of rebellious students into the Bohemian forest where they become Robin Hood-like bandits, while Franz Moore, the younger brother, schemes to inherit his father's considerable estate. The play's critique of social corruption and its affirmation of proto-revolutionary republican ideals astounded its original audience. Schiller became an overnight sensation. Later, Schiller would be made an honorary member of the French Republic because of this play. The play was inspired by Lysowitz, earlier play Julius of Tarrant, a favorite of the young Schiller. In 1780, he obtained a post as regimental doctor in Stuttgart, a job he disliked. In order to attend the first performance of the robbers in Mannheim, Schiller left his regiment without permission. As a result, he was arrested, sentenced to 14 days of imprisonment, and forbidden by Karl Eugen from publishing any further works. He fled Stuttgart in 1782, going via Frankfurt, Mannheim, Leipzig, and Dresden to Weimar. Along this journey he had an affair with an army officer's wife Charlotte von Kalb. She was at the center of an intellectual circle, and she was known for her cleverness and instability. Schiller needed help from his family and friends to extricate himself from his financial situation and attachment to a married woman. Schiller settled in Weimar in 1787. In 1789, he was appointed professor of history and philosophy in Jena, where he wrote only historical works. He was ennobled in 1802, thereby adding the honorific von to his name. Topic: 
Marriage and Family On the 22nd of February 1790, Schiller married Charlotte von Langfeld, 1766 to 1826. Two sons, Karl Friedrich Ludwig and Ernst Friedrich Wilhelm, and two daughters, Caroline Louise Henriette and Louise Henriette Emily, were born between 1793 and 1804. The last living descendant of Schiller was a grandchild of Emily, Baron Alexander von Gleichen Ruhrwurm, who died at Baden-Baden, Germany, in 1947. Weimar and later career Schiller returned with his family to Weimar from Jena in 1799. Goethe convinced him to return to playwriting. He and Goethe founded the Weimar Theater, which became the leading theater in Germany. Their collaboration helped lead to a renaissance of drama in Germany. For his achievements, Schiller was ennobled in 1802 by the Duke of Saxe Weimar, adding the nobiliary particle, von to his name. He remained in Weimar, Saxe Weimar until his death at 45 from tuberculosis in 1805. Topic. Legacy and honors The first authoritative biography of Schiller was by his sister-in-law Caroline von Wolzogen in 1830, Schiller's Leben Schiller's Life. The coffin containing what was purportedly Schiller's skeleton was brought in 1827 into the Weimarer Fersengruft Weimar's Ducal Vault, the burial place of the House of Saxe-Weimar-Eisenach in the historical cemetery of Weimar and later also Goethe's resting place. On 3 May 2008, scientists announced that DNA tests have shown that the skull of this skeleton is not Schiller's, and his tomb is now vacant. The physical resemblance between this skull and the extant death mask as well as to portraits of Schiller, had led many experts to believe that the skull was Schiller's. The city of Stuttgart erected in 1839 a statue in his memory on a square renamed Schillerplatz. A Schiller monument was unveiled on Berlin's Gendarmenmarkt in 1871. Friedrich Schiller, the German poet, philosopher, historian, and dramatist, statue on Belle Isle in Detroit, Michigan. This statue of the German poet and playwright was commissioned by Detroit's German American community in 1908 at a cost of $12,000. The designer was Hermann Matson. His image appeared on the German Democratic Republic 10 mark banknotes of the 1964 emission. In September 2008, Schiller was voted by the audience of the TV channel Arte as the second most important playwright in Europe after William Shakespeare. Topic: <laughs> Freemasonry. Some Freemasons speculate that Schiller was a Freemason, but this has not been proven. In 1787, in his tenth letter about Don Carlos, Schiller wrote, I am neither Illuminati nor Mason, but if the fraternization has a moral purpose in common with one another, and if this purpose for human society is the most important. In a letter from 1829, two Freemasons from Rudolstadt complain about the dissolving of their lodge Gunther Zumstehenden Lohen that was honored by the initiation of Schiller. According to Schiller's great-grandson Alexander von Gleichen Ruhrwurm, Schiller was brought to the lodge by Wilhelm Heinrich Karl von Gleichen Ruhrwurm. No membership document has been found. Topic: Writing. Topic: Philosophical papers. Schiller wrote many philosophical papers on ethics and aesthetics. He synthesized the thought of Immanuel Kant with the thought of the German idealist philosopher, Karl Leonard Reinhold. He elaborated Christoph Martin Wieland's concept of die schöne Seele the beautiful soul, a human being whose emotions have been educated by reason, so that Flicht und Neging duty and inclination are no longer in conflict with one another. Thus beauty, for Schiller, is not merely an aesthetic experience, but a moral one as well, the good is the beautiful. The link between morality and aesthetics also occurs in Schiller's controversial poem, Die Götter Griechenlandes, The Gods of Greece. The gods in Schiller's poem are thought by modern scholars to represent moral and aesthetic values, which Schiller tied to paganism and an idea of enchanted nature. In this respect, Schiller's aesthetic doctrine shows the influence of Christian theosophy. There is general consensus among scholars that it makes sense to think of Schiller as a liberal, and he is frequently cited as a cosmopolitan thinker. 
Schiller's philosophical work was particularly concerned with the question of human freedom, a preoccupation which also guided his historical researches, such as the Thirty Years' War and the Dutch Revolt, and then found its way as well into his dramas The Wallenstein Trilogy concerns the Thirty Years' War, while Don Carlos addresses the revolt of the Netherlands against Spain, Schiller wrote two important essays on the question of the sublime Das Erhabin, entitled, Vom Erhabenen, and Uber Das Erhabin. These essays address one aspect of human freedom—the ability to defy one's animal instincts, such as the drive for self-preservation, when, for example, someone willingly sacrifices themselves for conceptual ideals. Dramas Schiller is considered by most Germans to be Germany's most important classical playwright. Critics like F.J. Lamport and Eric Auerbach have noted his innovative use of dramatic structure and his creation of new forms, such as the melodrama and the bourgeois tragedy. What follows is a brief, chronological description of the plays. The Robbers die Rauber. The language of the robbers is highly emotional, and the depiction of physical violence in the play marks it as a quintessential work of Germany's romantic Sturm und Drang movement. The Robbers is considered by critics like Peter Brooks to be the first European melodrama. The play pits two brothers against each other in alternating scenes, as one quests for money and power, while the other attempts to create revolutionary anarchy in the Bohemian forest. The play strongly criticizes the hypocrisies of class and religion, and the economic inequities of German society. It also conducts a complicated inquiry into the nature of evil. Schiller was inspired by the play Julius of Tarrant by Johann Anton Lysowitz. Fiesco Die Verschwörung des Fiesco zu Genua Intrigue and Love Kabali und Liebe, the aristocratic Ferdinand von Walter wishes to marry Louise Miller, the bourgeois daughter of the city's music instructor. Court politics involving the Duke's beautiful but conniving mistress Lady Milford and Ferdinand's ruthless father create a disastrous situation reminiscent of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Schiller develops his criticisms of absolutism and bourgeois hypocrisy in this bourgeois tragedy. Act 2, Scene 2 is an anti-British parody that depicts a firing squad massacre. Young Germans who refuse to join the Hessians and British to quash the American Revolutionary War are fired upon. Don Carlos, this play marks Schiller's entree into historical drama. Very loosely based on the events surrounding the real Don Carlos of Spain, Schiller's Don Carlos is another Republican figure. He attempts to free Flanders from the despotic grip of his father, King Philip. The Marquis Posa's famous speech to the king proclaims Schiller's belief in personal freedom and democracy. The Wallenstein trilogy, consisting of Wallenstein's camp, the Piccolomini, and Wallenstein's death, these plays follow the fortunes of the treacherous commander Albrecht von Wallenstein during the Thirty Years' War. Mary Stuart, Maria Stuart, this history of the Scottish Queen, who was Elizabeth I's rival, portrays Mary Stuart as a tragic heroine, misunderstood and used by ruthless politicians, including and especially, Elizabeth. The Maid of Orleans, Die Jungfrau von Orleans, about Joan of Arc. The Bride of Messina, Die Brat von Messina. William Tell, Wilhelm Tell. Demetrius, unfinished. Topic. Aesthetic letters A pivotal work by Schiller was on the aesthetic education of man in a series of letters Über die Aesthetische Erzeihung des Menschen in Einer Rehi von Briefen, first published 1794, which was inspired by the great disenchantment Schiller felt about the French Revolution, its degeneration into violence and the failure of successive governments to put its ideals into practice. Schiller wrote that, A great moment has found a little people. He wrote the letters as a philosophical inquiry into what had gone wrong, and how to prevent such tragedies in the future. In the letters he asserts that it is possible to elevate the moral character of a people, by first touching their souls with beauty, an idea that is also found in his poem Die Kunstler the artists, Only through beauty's morning gate, dost thou penetrate the land of knowledge. On the philosophical side, letters put forth the notion of der sinnliche Trieb, sinistrieb, the sensuous drive and Formtrieb, the formal drive. In a comment to Immanuel Kant's philosophy, Schiller transcends the dualism between Formtrieb and Sinistrieb with the notion of Spieltrieb, the play drive, derived from, as are a number of other terms, Kant's critique of the faculty of judgment. 
The conflict between man's material, sensuous nature and his capacity for reason form tree being the drive to impose conceptual and moral order on the world, Schiller resolves with the happy union of formtrieb and sinistrieb, the play drive, which for him is synonymous with artistic beauty, or living form. On the basis of Spieltrieb, Schiller sketches in letters a future ideal state a utopia, where everyone will be content, and everything will be beautiful, thanks to the free play of Spieltrieb. Schiller's focus on the dialectical interplay between Formtrieb and Sinistrieb has inspired a wide range of succeeding aesthetic philosophical theory, including notably Jacques Ranciere's conception of the aesthetic regime of art, as well as social philosophy in Herbert Marcuse. In the second part of his important work Eros and Civilization, Marcuse finds Schiller's notion of Spieltrieb useful in thinking a social situation without the condition of modern social alienation. He writes, Schiller's letters aim at remaking of civilization by virtue of the liberating force of the aesthetic function, it is envisaged as containing the possibility of a new reality principle. Musical settings Ludwig van Beethoven said that a great poem is more difficult to set to music than a merely good one because the composer must rise higher than the poet. Who can do that in the case of Schiller? In this respect Goethe is much easier," wrote Beethoven. There are relatively few famous musical settings of Schiller's poems. Notable exceptions are Beethoven's setting of And die Freude. Ode to Joy in the final movement of his Ninth Symphony, Johannes Brahms' choral setting of Nanny and De Mädchen's Klage by Franz Schubert, who set 44 of Schiller's poems as leader, mostly for voice and piano, also including Die Bergschaft. In 2005 Graham Waterhouse set Der Handschuh the glove for cello and speaking voice. The Italian composer Giuseppe Verdi admired Schiller greatly and adapted several of his stage plays for his operas. I Masnadieri is based on The Robbers, Giovanna D'Arco on The Maid of Orleans, Luisa Miller on Intrigue and Love, La Forza del Destino is based partly on Wallenstein, and Don Carlos on the play of the same title. Donizetti's Maria Stuarda is based on Mary Stuart, and Rossini's Guillaume Tell is an adaptation of William Tell. Nicola Vacai's Giovanna di Arco is based on the Maid of Orleans and his La Sposa di Messina on The Bride of Messina. Tchaikovsky's 1881 opera The Maid of Orleans is partly based on Schiller's work. The 20th-century composer Giseller Klebe adapted The Robbers for his first opera of the same name, which premiered in 1957. Schiller's burial A poem written about the poet's burial Works Plays Die Rauber The Robbers, 1781 Fiesco Die Verschwörung des Fiesco zu Genua, 1783 Kabali und Liebe Intrigue and Love, 1784 Don Carlos, Infant von Spanien Don Carlos, 1787 Wallenstein, 1800. Maria Stuart, Mary Stuart, 1800. Die Jungfrau von Orleans, The Maid of Orleans, 1801. Tyrandet, Princessin von China, 1801. Die Brat von Messina, The Bride of Messina, 1803. Wilhelm Tell, William Tell, 1804. Demetrius, Unfinished at His Death, Histories. Geschichte des Abfalls der Vereinigten Niederlande von der Spanischen Regierung or the Revolt of the Netherlands Geschichte des Dreijährigen Kriegs or a History of the Thirty Years' War Uber Volkerwandering, Kruzuge und Mittelalter or on the Barbarian Invasions, Crusaders and Middle Age translations Euripides, Iphigenia in Aulis William Shakespeare, Macbeth Jean Racine, Fedre Carlo Ghazi, Tyrandit, 1801 Prose Der Geisterseher or the Ghost Seer unfinished novel started in 1786 and published periodically. Published as book in 1789 Über die Asthetische Erzeihung des Menschen in Einer Rehi von Briefen on the Aesthetic Education of Man in a Series of Letters, 1794 Der Verbrecher aus Verlariner Ära Dishonored Irreclaimable, 1786 Poems 
and Die Freude Ode to Joy 1785 became the basis for the fourth movement of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony Der Tauker the Diver set to music by Schubert Die Kranische des Ibikus the Cranes of Ibikus Der Ring des Polycrates Polycrates Ring Die Bergschaft the Hostage set to music by Schubert Das Lied von der Glock Song of the Bell Das Verschleierte Bild zu Say the Veiled Statue at Say Der Hanschu the Glove Nanny set to music by Brahms Topic See also Friedrich Schiller train an express train in Germany Judgment of History Musen Almanac Schiller Park Columbus Ohio Topic References Topic Further reading Lonstein Peter January 1984 1981 Schiller's Leben. Frankfurt am Main, Fischer. ISBN 3-596-25621-6. Engel, Manfred. Schiller und wir Fernaus Grower Nahe. Oxford German Studies 37-2008-1, 37 49 Schiller's complete works are published in the following excellent editions. Historical Critical Edition by K. Godic, 17 volumes, Stuttgart, 1867-76. Sacular Ausgabe Edition by von der Helen, 16 volumes, Stuttgart, 1904-05. Historical Critical Edition by Gunther and Witkowski, 20 volumes, Leipzig, 1909-10. Other valuable editions are The Hempel Edition, 1868-74. The Boxberger edition, in Kirchner's National Literature, 12 volumes, Berlin, 1882 91. The edition by Kutcher and Zissler, 15 parts, Berlin, 1908. The Hornausgabe, 16 volumes, Munich, 1910, et. Seq. The edition of the Temple Classicer, 13 volumes, Leipzig, 1910 11. Helios Classicer, six volumes, Leipzig, 1911. Documents and other memorials of Schiller are in the Goethe und Schiller archive in Weimar. Topic: External links. Books by Friedrich Schiller at Project Gutenberg. Works by or about Friedrich Schiller at Internet Archive. Works by Friedrich Schiller at LibriVox, public domain audiobooks. Friedrich Schiller Chronology 2005 as Schiller Year, all dates Letters upon the Education of Man Letters upon the Aesthetic Education of Man in PDF format at filepedia.org Schiller Monument in Schiller Park, German Village, Columbus, Ohio Pittsburgh Schiller 6-8 as a full school classical academy magnet Schiller Multimedial combines a biographical observation by Norbert Ohlers with classic recordings and video clips. Mobile Schiller Mobile Java application containing 20 poems of Schiller. Say it loud, it's Schiller and it's proud what relevance does Schiller have today? By George Steiner at Signonsite.com Friedrich Schiller University of Jena An illustrated edition of Schiller's Aesthetic Letters, for free download Friedrich Schiller at Find a Grave Friedrich Schiller on IMDb